We're starting a new series this, this week uh, entitled On Earth As It Is in Heaven. And we're going to be, you know, some, someone has put it this way, that you could sum up the Christian mission by saying the job of Christians is to bring heaven into earth. The whole Christian mission is summarized and simply it's the chore of bringing the glory and the grace and the love of heaven into down, down to earth. This began when the king of heaven came from heaven to earth. And it continued through his ministry. Remember the kinds of things Jesus did as he healed the sick, as he gave sight to the blind, as he fed people who he knew were hungry, as he even kept a party going when they, they ran out of wine. These were all things that were pictures and intrusions of the power of the kingdom of heaven to earth. And it came in the greatest power when he rose again from the dead and, and showed the way that, 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 that God is going to conquer death by him and in him. And uh, his charge to his followers, to you and to me, is that we follow him in working to bring heaven to earth. But this is not something we do in our own power, by our own strength. It's actually something he does through his people. And one of the ways he does that through you and me is through prayer. And, you know, those, those words, those familiar words pr that we should pray, pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven are all about that charge, that mission to bring the presence of the kingdom of heaven to earth here and now. And so for the next couple weeks, we're going to be looking at the Lord's Prayer. And uh, I don't know, some of you might be familiar with the Lord's Prayer. I know for me, I heard it first as a little kid sitting in church. And just like we did today, you would hear the whole congregation kind of break out into this thing. And after a while, you memorized it, and it sort of became this background noise that you'd hear as you're sitting in church fidgeting and trying not to get in trouble, but uh, really wishing you were somewhere else, you know. Um, it's sort of just part of the church liturgy. And then, you know, what happened for me when I became kind of a, a student of the Bible and started studying the Bible for myself, discovered that there was profound meaning in the words of the Lord's Prayer. In fact, there's books and books and books written just about the Lord's Prayer and the concepts that are in the Lord's Prayer. And so I said, wow, that's, that's really an interesting thing. And so I started seeing the Lord's Prayer as sort of this summary of Christian faith and, and life, in a sense. And then later in my ministry, I started volunteering at a place called Market Street Mission, which is a, a recovery uh, ministry for, for people in, in the town I used to serve in. And I, I remember once being at a meeting, a, a recovery meeting, where everyone was talking about, uh, you know, um, one of those meetings that starts off with everyone introducing themselves by their first name and saying, hi, I'm an alcoholic or I'm a drug addict. And then they went on to, to share the deep struggles and profound issues they had. And then at the end, we all stood up and everybody recited together the Lord's Prayer. And it was eye-opening for me because after sitting in that meeting and hearing the stories of those guys and then saying the Lord's Prayer, it took on a whole new meaning, a whole new significance, not just an abstract theological summary, but, you know, what does it mean to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us somehow, deliver us from the evil one. And to, you know, to talk to people, to, or to hear that recited by people who are actually struggling and fighting for their own deliverance and asking God for their deliverance gave the, the prayer a whole new meaning. And, but even that was years ago, and now I, I should be more profound and more eloquent in my prayers, but I find a lot of times you kind of come to the end of yourself and there are situations in your life or situations in the lives of people you know and you care about, and you feel like you've got to pray for them or you should pray for them, but, but you're kind of at a loss. Like, what do I even pray in this situation? What, how do I possibly pray for this person or for this, for this problem that I'm facing or for this, for this circumstance that I just can't manage? And, and you know what I've come to? A useful thing to pray is, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us 
deliver this circumstance, deliver this situation, deliver our community from the attacks of the evil one. It's not the most profound or, or, uh, or uh, esoteric of the Bible's teachings, but I think it's one of the most useful ones. And so that's what we're going to be looking at the next, the next few, uh, few weeks here at church. And, and if you get to the place where you can just simply recite that prayer and apply it to whatever problem you're having in the moment and understand what you're saying, then we will have accomplished our goal. And we're going to start with a salutation because we take this for granted. And, and if you were raised in the Roman Catholic Church, I think you might refer to the Lord's Prayer as the Our Father. But Jesus' disciples asked him how to pray, and Jesus said, this is how you should pray. First of all, say, Our Father in heaven. And we take that for granted, but, but that was revolutionary in Jesus' day because Old Testament people didn't refer to God as a father. Pagan people would never have thought to pray to God as Father, but Jesus says, from now on when you pray, you can use these words, our Father in heaven. And that is really the, the highest blessing of the gospel, the highest blessing of the work of redemption is that he calls, is that God invites people like you and me to address him as our Father. So that's what I want to talk about to today. Uh, you know, it's far more than just a sentimental, cuddly way of looking at God. It, it's the profound achievement of the work of Christ for you and the highest privilege that you have as a Christian. And uh, what I want to do is look at Romans chapter 8, where Paul expands on this idea. Uh, and hopefully this will be something you begin to understand in a new way today. Romans 8, starting in verse 14, Paul the Apostle writes, those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his suffering in order that we might also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings aren't even worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjugated it in the hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship. And this is the redemption of our bodies. And this is God's word for us today. So what I believe and what, what this passage shows us is that bringing heaven to earth begins with you personally beginning to understand what it means to be a child of God. Because what is heaven? In essence, one of the things heaven is, is it, it, it'll be that time when finally the fullness of your, your sonship, the fullness of your adoption is experienced in your life but we can begin to experience that a little more as we understand and as the Holy Spirit works on us. So I want to just go through four things here. First, this salutation, our Father tells us of our status before God, which is the basis for prayer. In the pagan world of the ancient Near East, the basis for prayer was usually sacrifices people would bring. They bring their goats, they bring their sheep, they bring money maybe to the temple and they'd make a sacrifice, and based on that sacrifice, they might be, feel permitted to offer a, uh, offer a prayer or a request to God. And in the Jewish, the Old Testament people mo usually thought in terms of their compliance with the law. If they had kept all the rules, if they were following all the laws of God, then they felt they were entitled to come before God and make their requests to God. 
But Jesus comes and he says there's a new way to come before God. He's not a king that you need to bring an offering to. It's not, it's not, he doesn't have a checklist and he's making sure you've crossed off everything and then he'll hear your prayers. But he invites you to address God and think of God and experience God as your Father in heaven. And this was a revolutionary idea. This was a new idea, a new way of thinking about God and addressing God that Jesus introduced to his disciples. It wasn't something he, he inherited from someone else. It was saying, you've got to completely rethink how, who it is you're praying to and how it is you're getting through to him. And when you pray, say, our Father who is in heaven. And so that was Jesus' idea. And then, then just so you understand, now we're looking at Paul today, and Paul took that idea and he ran with it, and he developed it further, particularly in Romans 8 and Galatians 3 and in other places. He developed this idea of what it means to be a child of God, and, and in other places in, in the New Testament it's developed further as well. But Paul's interesting contribution is he, he looked at Roman law in his day, and, and the Romans of the first century had incredibly strong adoption laws, so that in Roman law, if you adopted a child, that child was given all the full rights of a naturally born child, and all, all of the privileges of a naturally born ch ch child, so that the adopted children and begotten children were were on the same uh, playing field. And that's what Jesus came to do. What the Bible tells us is that God has one begotten Son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. You know that? Some of you heard that verse before? Nod your head if you know that verse. God has one begotten Son, but through the generosity and through the work of that one begotten Son, God has found many adopted children. And as this passage says, we're all co-heirs with Christ. Jesus comes to be our King, but also to be our Savior, but also to be our Redeemer, and also to become our brother and to share his status, to share his access to God with us. As Jesus, or as Paul here says, you can pray, the Spirit in us cries out, Abba, Father. He's using the very words that Jesus used when he prayed at his most desperate and most earnest times when he was addressing his Father who was in heaven. So what this means is to be a Christian, it's not simply that you're saved from hell. It's not simply that you're right about religion and other people are wrong about religion. It's not simply that you were raised in America and not in, in India or a place where people believe different things. But it means, in essence, that you are invited into the presence of God and you can relate to God as a father would relate to his children. It's, you know, our relationship with God is not a boss-employee relationship. It's not a customer-vendor kind of relationship. It's a family relationship. You know, if, if God is your boss and you're his employee, then, you know, there's a danger that you might get fired, right? Or if God is a vendor and you're a customer, you might say, well, this isn't working out for me. Or, or the vendor might say, well, you can't afford what I'm giving anymore. But if God is your father and you are a family member, that relationship is completely different. And so our relationship with God is based on this status that we, that we call him father. I mean, one way to look at this is, is you think of, think of your family. And probably many of you, and you think of your family, your extended family. There's people who you're related to where if you weren't related to them, you would have no relationship with them. Can, you, can everybody visualize that person? If you can't think of that person, you might be that person. Just, <laughs> just keep that in mind. Uh, but uh, but, but, that, but, but you, you maintain that relationship and you see them at Christmas and at Easter and things like that because they're family, right? And, and, that, and that status as family puts them in a different category in the, in the series of relationships that you maintain. But what it means to be a child of God is that our relationship with him is not based on our performance. Our relationship with him is not based on what we have to offer him. Our relationship with him is based on the privilege we have as, as those who are adopted into his family. And just as Jesus himself has privileges before the throne of God, so do you 
as the brother of Christ, as the adopted child of God. Uh, you know, I think in this day, but I guess in, in every day and age, we think, spend a lot of time thinking about our relationship status. And, you know, a lot of times you're filling out forms and it's like, what's your relationship status? And you're like, which, well, which box should I check, you know? Single, in a relationship, or just it's complicated. And, and you don't know which, which one applies to you. And the, or then if your relationship status changes, you're like, well, do I want to update this on all these things? If I update my relationship status on Facebook, is it going to send an announcement out to 1,200 people who I've known over the years? And so, so sometimes it gets a little confusing and you, you wonder about these things. But what it means to be a child of God, what it means to call God Father, is that the relationship status that defines you is not whether you're single or married or in a relationship or, or divorced or widowed or bereaved or whatever it might be, but the new relationship status that defines you ultimately and essentially and permanently and eternally is the fact that you're a child of God and you go back to that. And so when we're struggling with what our relationship status is or relationship status isn't what we wish it was, this is the foundation we can come back to because we can't get our security and our identity from, from our other relationship statuses as they come and go. We've got to find it in our connection to with God. All of our other statuses become secondary when that becomes real to us. So it's that status as a child of God that is, that is the thing that redefines us. And that's also where our prestige comes from. You know, in this world, we tend to be drawn into to various status symbols. And, you know, for different people, those might be different things, but they're, they're symbols, you know, th things that we purchase to let other people know what our real status is, what our real importance and what our real significance is. And you know, what ends up happening most of the time is we spend money we don't have on stuff we don't actually need in an effort to impress people who don't care, right? And uh, have you ever found yourself doing that? And, but but when, when you find your new identity as being a child of the king and you realize that your brother of the savior of the universe or a sister of the savior of the universe. You've got a new basis for status, a new, a new status that's not symbolic, but that is real. And, and you can go back to that as the basis for your security, the basis for your identity. But it's not just a status, it's also an existential experience. Look at verse 15 and 16. He says, the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. The job of the Holy Spirit in this day and age, one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to give you an assurance that you actually are a child of God. Because, you know, some of the deepest brokenness and deepest heartbreak in our life comes from broken relationships or relationship disappointment or relationship loss or relationship lack in various places and in various ways. And this idea of being a child of God, this, teach, this New Testament idea of being a child of God is not something that, that we just paint over all of those things, but it's something that goes to the core of your being. And the Spirit of God testifies with your spirit that you are a child of God, and that's what heals you. That's what makes you whole. That's what gives you peace. And that's what gives you joy in all of the ups and downs and tumults and fears that we have in life. And so, so it, we have the status of knowing God's our Father, but then we also, by the Holy Spirit, should have the experience of the Spirit testifying with our spirit that we are indeed children of God. And when we're experiencing bad things and difficult things and painful things in other areas of our life, we can go back to this hope, we can go back to this reality, and we can go back to this dynamic in our lives. And uh, like I mentioned, he invites us here. He says, the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are, we are God's children, and it calls out, it enables us to call out, Abba, Father. And that's to echo the prayer of Jesus, the intimacy that Jesus had, the assurance that Jesus had when he prayed in his most desperate moments, and he was calling out to God. That Those are the words that we are invited to use. That's the, that's the experience we're invited to have. You know, what happened, 
we, we talk about bringing heaven to earth. The mission of Christians is to bring heaven to earth. But, but that starts with the presence of heaven coming to earth in our own lives, in our own consciousness, and in our own experience. Because sometimes life on earth can be a little hellacious for the best of us, and even for the most charmed of life's lives. And how do we, how do we manage that? You know, we want to escape, we want to run away, but, but what the Bible invites us to do instead is to go back to and be renewed in our experience and in the reality that heaven has come down to earth and the presence of heaven can come to earth to us and through us and with us as the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Our deepest pains and our deepest losses and our deepest griefs, and believe me, life here has its pains, it has its losses, it has its griefs, but they find their resolution, they find their relief, they find their restoration as we experience what it means to pray, Father in heaven. So it's a new status, it's a new experience, but it's also a new struggle for us. In verse 17, Paul says it this way, we're co-heirs with Christ, he shares with us his inheritance, but we also share his sufferings. There's a challenge that goes along with finding your new identity as a, a child of God, and, and it can be a, a life-shaking challenge. You think of the life of Christ as the, the Son of God who came down, and uh, life was pretty difficult for him, right? He was misunderstood a lot of times, and, and a lot of, uh, he had to work through a lot, of, a lot of challenges. He was despised and rejected. He was let down and denied by his friends, and nobody really grasped the vision that was driving him. A lot of, and as he was on earth, remember, even though he had this intimate relationship with God, a lot of his prayers went unanswered. And he even went through his own dark night of the soul, even as he was conscious of and even as he believed in his identity as a child of God. So that's a fair warning to you and to me, to all of us, if you're going to claim this identity. It doesn't mean that life's always going to be easy. It doesn't mean that all of your plans are going to succeed and everything's going to work out the way you want it to. It means that in the midst of all that, we can, we can have hope. In verse 22, he puts it this way, that the creation was subject to frustration and that all creation groans. We're in the, groan, in, in the stage of history where creation groans. And we don't have to look far for that. We look globally with, uh, with how the environment is being affected. We look socially with the divisions in society. We look uh, nationally and internationally at the conflict between nations and the conflict between groups around the world. We look... Uh, we look at the political environment in our country and in every other country, and there's all kinds of things that are broken. There's all kinds of things that are unfair. There's all kinds of people who are suffering in, in all kinds of difficult ways. There's pathologies in our cities. There's addictions in the suburbs. Closest to home for many of us, there's breakdowns in our closest relationships with our, with our family members. Uh, and, and there's bodily breakdowns for others of us when we suffer with serious physical problems. But Jesus entered into the groaning of creation. Jesus participated in the groaning of creation so that he could be a part of the redemption of creation. And Jesus' identity as the Son of God didn't exempt him from suffering. In fact, it caused more suffering. It, he was inten it was intensified because of his connection with the Father and because he felt accountable to do what the Father wanted him to do, not was, what was easy or expedient in the moment. And so the challenge for you and me, if we take this mantle, if we decide to live this out, and if we find our ultimate status as children of God, then we're going to be making unfortunate decisions that result in all kinds of difficulty and hardship for us, just as Jesus had to for us, for, had, to, had to suffer and had to work for us. So the challenge is as we share in that status, we're also going to share in his sufferings. Uh, we, we'll, have, we'll share in the, 
brokenness and loss and pain of this world will be another thing I think that happens as you grow in this, you become more sensitive to the groaning of the world. Whereas you might be inclined to just live your life and, and take care of yourself and, and take care of the few people that are closest to you. As your heart is opened by God and as your heart is opened to your identity as a child of God, one of the things that happens is we become more aware of people who are suffering around us, whether it's friends or family members or neighbors or people in our city or people on, in other countries and other continents. And sometimes entering into their suffering and getting involved in their challenges is another way that, that brings, brings suffering on on ourselves. We become more vulnerable to the pathologies of the world because instead of protecting ourselves from poverty and heartache and disease, we try to help people who are bearing those burdens and end up burdening ourselves. And uh, so, so I just want to say that Paul is in tremendously re realistic. On the one hand, he gives us this glorious picture of being a co-heir with Christ. And then he says, but oh, by the way, in the meantime, you're going to have to share in his sufferings, so that one day you will also share in his glory. So bringing heaven to earth is not easy and it's not painless. In fact, it's probably more painful than just settling in and getting comfortable on earth. But it opens us up to the glory of experiencing our identity as a, as a child of God. And I think as you do that, you'll find it's worth it. But mostly and ultimately, you'll find it worth it because because this this process brings us to experience a hope, a supernatural hope. Paul puts it this way. Yeah, we're going to share in the sufferings of Christ. But then he says, but our present sufferings are not even worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. Promise of the Bible is that we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known. But when he appears, we will be like him for we'll see him as he is. And, and right now, this is a status that we embrace by faith, that we experience in our hearts as the Holy Spirit works on us, as the, the Holy Spirit works on you. Your experience of being a child of God will become more and more real to you in, in, your, in your personal existential experience. But one day, that's going to be revealed. Right now, you're incognito and you're bankers and doctors and lawyers and nurses and teachers and students and, and you're going through your life and you look just like everybody else. But one day, a glory is going to be revealed in you and you're going to become something spectacular. As C.S. Lewis says that, that what it means to be a child of God is to remember that or to, to see people as children of God is to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you might talk to right now will one day, through the power of God, become a creature which, if you saw him now, you would be strongly tempted to worship them. You know, that's what, what Paul is talking about when he says, our present sufferings are not worthy to be compared to the glory that is going to be revealed in us. The glory of what it means to be a child of God is something that's so blinding, something so staggering, something so, so, so powerful that, that it's veiled to us right now just as it's veiled to everyone else. And we experience it by faith. We experience it through the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and even as we go through our lives incognito now, keeping it kind of a secret between us and God and the Holy Spirit that actually... I'm not a teacher. Actually, I'm not just a student. Actually, I'm not just a dad or a mom. Actually, I'm a child of God Most High. And as we go through all the frustrating things that life throws at us and all the disappointments and all the humiliating things and all the irritating things, and, and there's something in you that knows you're made for so much more and something in you that, that knows that your life is supposed to be so much more and something in you that knows that there's nothing in this world that can ultimately satisfy us. That's all serves to point us to the fact that what will ultimately satisfy us is something beyond this world, something that's coming to this world. And that's the full experience of our new identity as those who are children of God. 
you know, right now the struggles and the losses that we have loom so large, but one day what's going to be revealed is the glory in us, the glory in us as those who've been adopted by God, the glory in us as those who are brothers of Christ. Remember at the transfiguration, right before Jesus' suffering, he was up with his disciples and he was transfigured before them and they got a glimpse of his glory and they could barely look at him because his face was so bright, because his countenance was so bright. But one day, that's how our countenance will be. One day, that's the glory that we will have. Right now, you know, we might be losing our hair. We might not like what we see in the mirror. You know, we might have, have various struggles. But one day, that glory will be revealed. One day, our job titles, our relationship status, our bank balance, our street address will all become inconsequent, inconsequential. One day, our pain and sorrow will be not worth comparing to the glory that we've had. And we'll take, you will take your rightful place as a child of the King, as a co-heir with Christ. And until then, we can pray, our Father in heaven. Let's pray now. Father, I just particularly want to pray for those who... Uh, are sharing in the sufferings of Christ at a level right now that is, uh, feels unbearable to them. I pray that you would give them this hope, this hope of glory in the midst of the humiliations, the heartbreak, the rejections, and the agony. Give them this hope and help us to live in that hope and to have joy in the midst of our struggle because we know who we are. We are your child. Make that real to us, we pray, through Jesus, our elder brother. Amen.